Well, thanks for having me, guys. I, I appreciate it. I always enjoy these, uh, these discussions. Um, I've spoken at a lot of USA Hockey um, symposiums, clinics over the years. Uh, I've been very involved in the Boston area. As I said last night, that's where, that's where I was born and raised, and that's where my family is now, and my three children have participated in hockey in the Boston area uh, for the last 20 years. So uh, on and off, given my moves through the NHL, but uh, we've, always, we've always called Boston our home, so we've spent a fair amount of time in, in the Boston area. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that, that I hope I can, I can bring to the table here is just a, a, a certain perspective that might be a little bit different from, from others in the sense that I come to you from, for, from someone that's, that's coached and played at, at the NHL level, but I also come to you from someone that has had three children participate in grassroots hockey and have grown up and, uh, you know, taken kids to the rink. I've coached my kids and I've also been a parent on a team that my kids have participated on. So um, I think both of those experiences kind of offer a certain perspective and, and kind of have, have helped me in the, through the process of, of trying to understand development and uh, the, the respective uh, stages along the way, if you will. So um, that, that's kind of my background in a, in a nutshell. Um, when Ken asked me to speak a few weeks ago, he, he asked me, he, it was a really broad topic, right? He said, we're, we're talking about development. And I asked him, I said, well, what are the, age, what are the age, ages of the, uh, the coaches that are going to be there? What, what age groups are they coaching? And he suggested to me that it's, it's the teen years, right? So it's 15, 16, 17. So are you guys, just kind of a show of hands, are we high school coaches, junior coaches, midget coaches? Yes, no? All of the above? Are there any peewee coaches? Yeah, so we have some peewee coaches, but it's mostly that kind of that teen year right before you go to college, I guess, right? So that's the group? Okay, uh, that, that's what I thought. So I'm gonna kind of bring you something I think today that you probably don't expect. Um, it's, it's a little bit different. I, I hope you'll appreciate it. Um, one, one of the things that I've thought about a lot as I've, especially for the last 10 or 11 years since I've been coaching uh, in the NHL, is just trying to understand the whole development process. How does it take place? How do you make a player better? And it really, quite honestly, started with my kids when, when I started to get involved with, with coaching the youth age group. Because I think, you know, you guys are at a particular point in, in their in their development stage that is so impressionable. And you can have such a huge impact on, on the kids that you're coaching. So I went on this kind of escapade on trying to understand development. Um, and, and it took me down kind of an intellectual road. And, and that's what I'm gonna bring to you today. I know, and, and you know, you may like it, you may not, but uh, tough. I'm, I, I already put it together, so I hope you'll I hope you'll appreciate it. Okay. And so what I did was is is uh, the first thing I'm going to do today is is I want to identify some sought after qualities of an elite player. So I'm going to talk to you about it, and, and I'll put my Blackhawks hat on now. With the Blackhawks, we we define a criteria that with certain qualities that we're looking for in our players. So. Right now, I follow the already drafted players that the Hawks have. So every time I go and I watch these guys play, I'm looking for these qualities in, in, their, in their play. And if not, I'm trying to figure out a way to make them better and improve in these qualities. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing that I'd like to do is just define what, what makes a quality hockey player. What are the attributes? Right? And so because I think if we, can, if we can define a criteria, now the next question is, is okay, how do we make it happen? How do, we, how do we help these guys in these respective areas? So that's the first thing. The second question I have for you is, is there a responsibility and a commitment to player development? So some of you guys, for example, might be varsity high school coaches. Some of you might be a junior coach. Is that the destination point? In other words, is, is that the end game? Or is there a responsibility and obligation for you guys to continue to work and improve the development of the individual on your team? And I hope to provide an argument that there is. Um, 
The next thing, and this is where the intellectual side of it's going to come in a little bit, is I want to discuss the science of skill acquisition and how learning takes place. Because I don't think there's enough of this that goes on in, in what we do. Because in essence, coaches are teachers, right? So the best teachers are teachers that apply strategies that leverage uh, knowledge on how people learn. So if we're going to be good coaches and we're going to be good teachers, it might make sense to st step back a little bit and have a discussion on, well, how do kids learn? How does skill acquisition actually take place? And if we have a, a basic understanding of that, now we can say to ourselves, okay, what's the best approach here? What kind of a strategy or a coaching methodology can I apply that will leverage what I know as far as how people learn? Okay, so that's kind of the road I want to go down today a little bit, is just, the, just kind of a, 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 a basic rudimentary understanding of the science of skill acquisition, okay? And then the last point is, is and then I just talked to that point, is based on, on what we discuss, let's try to come up with some coaching strategies that are going to leverage what we've learned as far as uh, the science of skill acquisition and what neurologists and, and people that are, that are have dedicated their life to trying to understand this process are telling us. Okay, does that make sense? So that's kind of, when I put this presentation together, this is, what it, this is the thought process that I went through, so that, this is gonna be my attempt at, at trying to accomplish this, okay? And if anybody has any comments or questions, please feel free to, to jump in, okay? So back to the Hawks, we, we broke down four components. This is what we're looking for in, in players. Okay, and we've had discussions with this, and, I, and my guess is, if, is, is there's probably, these discussions are probably had in every NHL war room across the league. You know, I've been, in, I've been coaching in the NHL now for 10 or 11 years. I've been associated with one, two, three, four teams. Okay, four NHL franchises in 11 years. We kind of hired to get fired. That kind of is no fun, but that's, the, that's the, the tough part of the job. But having said that, in all of those four organizations, these types of discussions are being had, right? So with the Hawks this year, we, we've had lots of discussions, and, and most specifically in the player development department, the guys that go around and trying to, you know, trying to help the, the draft picks that we've already got, okay? We're trying to help them improve in these areas. So what are these things? You know, and, and they're probably in, in, in priority order. Right? The first thing, I, I use the phrase competitive spirit. You know, some people just say compete level, whatever it may be. For me, it's the foundation of excellence. If you don't have it, I think it's hard for you to even be in the conversation when you're discussing players, especially at the elite levels. Right? So for me, a, a, a person's compete level is something that we're looking for all the time in, in our players. We want highly competitive guys. The second one is functional intelligence. Well, what does that mean? You know, it's game sense, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that moving forward. You know, the third one is, is if you, anybody that watches the Blackhawks understand that they value the puck. They want to have the puck. They want to play with the puck. So puck possession skills are critical to the types of players that we're looking for in our organization. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And the last one is speed. Right? And speed, I think, is the, the great competitive advantage in sports, never mind hockey. It, but it's both physical speed, but it's also speed of mind. It's intellect, right? And so, and we talked a little bit about that last night in the discussion as far as the difference between, you know, our observations of watching the pro versus watching the college kids or junior kids or whatever. For me, the, the biggest thing that jumps out at me is just that, is players at the pro level um, the elite players, they think the game fast, in a timely fashion, faster than, their, than, than most of their peers, and that's why they're at the top of the food chain. Um, so speed is an important aspect of the game. It's a great competitive advantage. So these, these, you may think it's a simplistic formula, but these are the four things that we're looking for in a player. Okay, so now let's take them just one at a time. Because it's easy to say, hey, let's go out and, and look for these players. The next question I have is, is, well, how does that manifest itself in the game? So to say to someone, hey, I think this guy's competitive. Oh, really? Well, what makes you think that? What evidence does he provide that suggests that he's, this player is competitive? Okay, so we look for specifics. You know, we, we want to see... Uh, specific evidence shift in and shift out that a player is competitive, right? So what does that mean? So for example, next effort play. 
Does a, does a player give up on the puck? Is he a one and done guy? Is he a single effort player or is he a next effort player? And I use that phrase a lot with our guys when I'm talking with our, with our draft picks about being a next effort player, about constantly staying engaged in the play. Um, so that's the first thing. One-on-one -on -one battles. They happen all over the rink, right? One-on-one -on -one battles is a great indication of someone's compete level. Are you going to will? Are you going to uh, impose your will on your opponent? Okay, and, and no, better, no better evidence of someone's compete level is in one-on-one -on -one battle situations, okay? They take place along the wall. They take place in front of the net. So all of these instances are going to suggest to us whether or not a player is competitive or he's not, or she for that matter. Back checking, putting back pressure on the puck, the thankless jobs, right? The, jo the, 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 the little things that everybody talks about in hockey that you, ne you don't necessarily, you, you can't quantify. They don't necessarily show up on the score sheet. Nobody cheers for them, but everybody on the bench and the, and the coaching staff realize that these things are important for us to win. Those are the things that we're looking for as far as uh, whether or not we, we, dis we define someone as competitive or is not, okay? So the next thing is functional intelligence. It's game sense. Well, what does that mean? This is a little bit harder, and I think this is the, this is the, um, it's the art of scouting. And, and I think it separates some great scouts from some guys that, some guys are really good at evaluating talent. Other guys aren't so good. For me, this might be the hardest thing to recognize in players because you're, you're evaluating decisions that players make with and without the puck. Where do they go on the rink? Do they use their stick position a certain way to influence the puck or close a diagonal or close a passing lane, right? Do, do, does the ice that they occupy or the angle that they skate influence the puck a certain way that forces a turnover? These are all nuances of the game, but they're, they're also things that suggest whether or not a player has a high hockey IQ. You know, Lou Vero last night talked about um, Igor Larionov and, and Gretzky and these guys, and he called them geniuses. Well, these guys, they get it. They, it's part of their DNA, right? So this is an aspect, I think, of, of hockey that's, that's a critical element if you're going to be good. It's not so easy to, to, uh, to identify. You've got to watch closely, right? But this is something that, that we hold paramount for our players that we're looking for. We want guys that can think. Okay, the, the last point, just as, as far as in game sense, is just situational awareness. And what I mean by that is, is um, an understanding of the score of the game, the time on the clock, who has momentum. Is someone late in a shift or early in a shift? Do they have, if they're early in a shift, they got a lot of juice, and they might be able to take somebody on one-on-one. -on -one. If they're late in a shift and they don't have a lot of gas in the tank, and maybe they don't have time and speed, uh, and they're, they're approaching the offensive blue line, they don't have numbers, maybe that's the time to make a soft chip and get off the ice and get fresh legs on the ice, right? That's a good hockey decision. That makes someone hard to play against because they don't, they don't put themselves in a position where they're vulnerable, where, they, where they, they cause a turnover because they're tired or they're fatigued or they don't have support or they don't have speed, right? So the decisions that you make on the rink, especially situationally, are going to have a huge impact on your team's ability to win and lose. So these are things that we're looking for when we go and watch players. And we're trying to help them get better in those areas when, if we think they need improvement. I will tell you that in coaching in the NHL, we spend the majority of our time in the NHL coaching this, situational play. Why did you make this decision? What were you thinking? Right, here's the score of the game, here's the time on the clock, the other team has momentum, maybe you've got to make a simple play here. Right, so situational play is, a, is an important element of, of helping teams win and being a good player is in, in being difficult to play against, okay? So puck possession skills is the third category, and I think this is the most obvious. I think it jumps out at people when, when, when guys can handle the puck, right? And so I think everybody has an understanding of this, um, and it's obviously, it's the most obvious, right? I put shooting in there because I think, you know, we, we always talk about puck possession, but the goal is always to put it in the net. Right, so it, it's an important it, it, it's an important skill to have is your ability to shoot and your release and and those things to try to score goals. 
And the last one is speed, right? So skating is, is obvious. So we're looking, we're looking to create a pace game, to play a pace game in Chicago. And, and so th that's their team identity, right? They play, they play a possession game, they play a pace game. It's skill and it's quickness. They're not big. Like this is going to be an interesting series, the Hawks against Anaheim. Anaheim's a big, heavy team. Different team identity altogether. Uh, they're big, they're heavy. They have guys like Getzlaff and Perry and uh, Maroon, that first line. They're giants. They look like Coke machines with heads on them. And they're hard, right? So it's a whole different type of game. They're skilled. They can skate, but they don't necessarily play a pace game. They play a heavy game. They want to play territory. They want to control pucks down underneath the hash marks. That's their identity. That's their style. When you read their comments, the players' comments and the coaches' comments in the media, whether it be after the game or you read the newspapers, that's what they all talk about. We've got to establish a forecheck. We've got to get it behind them and go to work. If I, heard that, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that when I watched that series, the last couple of weeks I'd be a rich guy. Right, so that's what they're trying to create. The Hawks are a little different ball game. They play a possession game, they play a speed game, they play a transition game, so it's gonna be skill and quickness against Brute and Braun. Not to say that Anaheim isn't skilled, they are. They are, but it's a, it's a different style of play, right? So we're looking for skating. We, we want guys that can push the pace. But what about this side? Nobody thinks about this so much as far as speed, and this is, goes back to the speed of mind, right? It's your ability to recognize situations. It's awareness away from the puck. It's your ability to close down windows of opportunity because you see it, you see it in a timely fashion, right? That's what transition, in my mind, is all about. If you can't act on it if you don't see it. So speed of mind is a critical aspect as far as creating team speed in your transition game. So these are, these are the, the qualities that we're looking for, in a nutshell, in our players. When our, when our scouts go out and they're looking for draft picks, that's what they're trying to draft. Because the Hawks are trying to create a team identity, um, so they want to draft players that are going to lend to that identity. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about development. So, and I asked this question already, and I ask it again, do, you have, do we think we have a responsibility to players? Is there a commitment to the long-term growth? And I would suggest to you, yes. I know like at the NHL level, especially in the salary cap era, okay, the, the most important aspect as far as staying uh, competitive and sustaining a competitive level is your ability to, to, to draft and to develop from within. So development at the highest level of the game is taking place. Coaching staffs are talking about, we need to make our players better. How do we do it? We have to spend time at improving our individual players and their skill sets. Because if we do that, at the end of the year, hopefully we'll have a better hockey team because we have players that have better, more polished skill sets. Okay? So I would argue that that it is vitally important, regardless of where you are in the development process, whether you're a junior coach, a high school coach, a peewee coach, or you're coaching in the American League or the NHL. It is one of your main objectives as a coaching staff is to try to help the individuals on your team get better. Uh, I think it benefits all involved. It's going to benefit the player, obviously. He's a better player. It's definitely going to benefit the team, because if you have a group of players that have better skill sets, you should have a more competitive team. And I think personally as a coach, it's the most rewarding part of what we do. It's the most rewarding part of what we do. As far as, you know, I find so much uh, solace in knowing that I helped a player along the way. You know, I, I, we, we were able to help a player go from here to here. And, and to see the appreciation that some of the players have for the efforts that you put in and helping them along the way, for me, is a very rewarding experience as a coach. This question I ask, and we'll get back to it, but I threw this in there, does your style of play influence development? So think about that question. Because we're gonna talk a lot about skill acquisition and practice and things like that. But there's also another element of, of what's going on here, and that's as, as, as far as how you play and the parameters that you give your players when you, when you start to compete, right? So does your style of play influence the player's developments on your team? I'll give you one quick example. I know uh, 
I, I told you I'm, in, I'm from the Boston area, and I know of some high school coaches in the area that, that have rules on their team that they don't allow their defensemen to go D to D. So when the puck comes out of the offensive zone and they go back for the puck, they can't use their partner. So what are they going to do? Right? They're going to take advantage of the tag up rule. They're going to pound it back in. The players are going to come out and they're going to go back and they're going to forecheck. And so the majority of what they do is they practice forechecking because that's the style of play that they want to play. Right? Now, will he win more games? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe he'll win more games early on. I'm not sure you're going to win a championship that way. Right? So style of play and the rules of thumb that you're going to give your players are going to have an impact on their development and their ability to grow as players. And so I ask you that question. Okay, how many, how many people have heard of this book, The Talent Code? It's a, it's a fabulous read, and this is it right here. Okay, and I'm gonna bring, you, I'm gonna bring some, the, the next few slides here, we're gonna talk about this book, because it talks all about skill acquisition. Okay, so this, the, the whole premise of the book is this, right? The Talent Code is built on revolutionary scientific discoveries invol involving a neuroinsulator called myelin. How many people have heard of the word myelin, right? It's the white matter in your brain. It's an important aspect of, of our biology, okay? Some neurologists consider myelin to be the holy grail of acquiring skill. So how does it happen? How do you acquire skill? Every human skill is created by chains of nerve fibers carrying a tiny electrical impulse. Okay, it's a signal traveling through a circuit. Myelin's role is to wrap those nerve fibers the same way that rubber insulation wraps copper wire, making the signal stronger and faster by preventing those impulses from leaking out. Okay, so skill acquisition takes place in your brain not in your muscles. When we fire our circuits the right way, whether we are practice swinging a bat, playing a music note, shooting a hockey puck, learning how to skate backwards, working on a crossover, our myelin responds by wrapping layers of insulation around the neural circuit. Each new layer adding a bit more skill and speed. This is biologically how it happens. Okay, the thicker the myelin gets, the better it insulates, the faster and more accurate our movements and thoughts become. So why is it important? Number one, it's universal. Everybody can grow it, okay? Number two, it grows most swiftly in children, and in particular, in the teen years, right? Which is the age group that you guys are working with, right? The teen years, the brain's key development period as far as information processing pathways, it's very receptive to myelin. Okay, so you know, in, in sports we talk a lot about muscle memory, right? And really, muscle memory, it's really not muscle memory, it has nothing to do with muscles. It has everything to do with your brain. It's myelination, that's what it is, okay? And that's how you create automacity, where you don't have to think about what you're doing, okay? That's the process, biologically, how it happens, okay? It's growth, uh, myelin growth, takes place as far as skill acquisition, both mental and physical. So it's whether you're learning how to read, or learning how to play an instrument, or learning how to do a crossover, or learning how to hit a baseball. The same process takes place as far as the skill acquisition biologically in your brain, okay? This guy, Dr. George Botsokis, the professor of neurology at UCLA, okay, he says that myelin is the key to learning skills. The more we fire a circuit, the more myelin optimizes that circuit, the stronger and faster and more fluent the movement become. This is a word that they use a lot in psychology, it's called chunking. How many people have heard of that word, chunking, right? It's, a, it's an interesting concept. All skill acquisition takes place this way. What happens is, is your brain groups important elements together in a framework. So they've done studies, for example, with uh, an example of, of chunking would be when you learn how to read and you understand that certain letters, when you put, put them together, they make a certain sound. Like a TH, for example, right? Or an ING, right? That's, that's an example of chunking. They've done a lot of studies with chess players where they'll, they'll take a, a chess board, they'll put the, the pieces on the board, and they'll flash it on a screen really fast, and then they'll, they'll take it off, and they'll ask different chess players at different stages, from master chess players to novices, to recall where the pieces were. The master chess players can recall every piece. They flash it quick, they get a real quick 
picture of the, of the board, they can recall where every piece is. The interesting part of the study is, is when they put the pieces in certain places that they don't normally occur in a chess game, and I don't play chess, so it's hard for me to understand this, but when they, when they put the pieces in, in places where they're not normally, they, they aren't normally are, the master chess players cannot recall where the pieces are. They have the same memory recall as the novice. Okay, so the, the takeaway from that is that's how the learning process takes place. It's chunking, it's anticipatory skills, where you create, when, when you train something, you create a database. You create a database in your mind through this chunking process, and that's how skill acquisition takes place. Right, so it's like when Albert Pujols is hitting a baseball, okay, he's, he's keying off a certain cues of the pitcher so that he can put, the, put his bat on the ball. Okay, it's the same process as the master chess player that takes place. So what do good athletes do when they train? They send these, these impulses along wires that, that give the signal to myelinate. They end up, after all their training, with, with a super-duper highway, right? Lots of bandwidth. It's a high-speed line. And, and, and that's how you create instinctive skills, okay? So that's the process that takes place biologically in your body when you're acquiring skills, okay? So the next question is, how, does it, how, do, we, how do we leverage these things? How does it happen, okay? And I throw this, this quote up at you to start this off. You will become clever through your mistakes, okay? Let's go back to, uh, to the talent code, okay? This guy, Robert B Bjork, who's the chair of psychology at UCLA, he says that the more we generate impulses encountering and overcoming difficulties, the more scaffolding we build, okay? So struggle is an important aspect, okay? Now, the objective is to find the sweet spot. We can't overwhelm our athletes, but we have to put them in an environment where they're challenged. Okay, in our, in our, uh, in our vernacular in sports, we use the word comfort zones, right? You guys have heard that word before, where you're trying, as coaches, you're always trying to push the bar. You're trying to challenge comfort zones. That's, that's what we're talking about here, is we're looking for that sweet spot that's just beyond the player's abilities. And, and if we can, we can put them in that sweet spot and, and tr train them in that environment, that's how the optimal skill ap acquisition and development will take place. Okay? So we have to, in essence, we are targeting the struggle. Okay? They use this term, deep practice. Purposely operating at the edges of one's ability. And I'll go back to the comfort zones, right? Challenging comfort zones. Why is this targeted mistake-focused practice so effective? because it's the best way to build circuits. We'll go back to the biology, right? The, the brain fires until it wires. We fire, we attend, we make mistakes, we attend to the mistakes, and then we myelinate. And that's how the process takes place. So struggle's not an option. It's a biological requirement. If all we do is practice in a comfort area, if all we do is flow drills, and we never challenge players' abilities, and we never, we never try to put them in an environment where they're operating at the edges of their abilities, then we are not going to create an environment that's optimal for development. They will not get, they will not optimize their potential, okay? Deep practice is built on this paradox, struggling in certain targeted ways, operating at the edges of your ability, where you make mistakes make you smarter, right? If you're going to challenge someone's ability level, and you're going to take them out of their comfort zones, they are going to make mistakes. So how you react to those mistakes as a coach is critically important to their ability to develop and get better. I almost think in practice, you guys should create a safe environment where, where mistakes are okay, where you know, we're not going to judge. We're not going to judge. You know, we always talk a lot about perfection. You know, we want, we want to, we're trying to avoid this all the time. We're trying to avoid this. But when we go back to development, if we want to make players better, we're going to put them in a situation where it's, it's essential for them to get better, right? So that, that's the takeaway, is let's not, just, let's not just practice in this zone, in this false environment, where we're, we're, we're going to try to avoid the mistake process, let's challenge abilities, let's push the bar, let's push the envelope, and they are going to make mistakes. 
but they're gonna, they're gonna make mistakes in a safe environment where they're not gonna be judged by their coaching staff. And that, for me, is the takeaway. That's how you make players better. So thrashing blindly doesn't help, but reaching does. Targeting the struggle is an important aspect of a coach, okay? You've gotta understand where your players are, what their limitations are, and where their potentialities may lie, and you're going, to try to, you're going to try to put them in an environment on a weekly basis that's going to challenge their potentialities. Okay, this book here, The Sports Gene by David Epstein, is a really interesting book, and it's the same thing, right? It's all these guys trying to understand this whole idea of, uh, of human performance. How does this all happen, right? So they're all studying this, right? And he talks about skill acquisition as well. And, and in, the, in this book, one of the things they talk about is that no one is born with anticipatory skills, right? So in this book, what they talk about is, is uh, elite performances consist of two things, hardware and software. Hardware is your gene pool. It's what you get handed from your parents, okay? And your gene pool has to be receptive to training. Some gene pools are more receptive to training than others. Okay, and, and so those are the elite athletes, right? So that they're inclined in certain aspects because of their genetic makeup. But the other aspect, that's the hardware. It's hard to control that. You get that from your parents, right? But the software is the training. The software is what kind of an environment do we put them in so that they can build a database that, like I was talking about, so they can, they can uh, create these anticipatory skills or develop these anticipatory skills that, that are required to hit a baseball or to one time a puck or whatever, right? So once again, as, as you get better and you train in this environment, this is what happens, right? So the, the process in your brain goes from the front part of your brain where it's conscious to the more primitive aspect of, of your brain where you do things without thinking. That's how, you, that's how biologically your body works. Right? So the better you get at something, you create automacity. Okay? So we, we, we use the word instinctive play. Right? So we don't have to think about it. It just happens. Right? Or muscle memory is that other phrase that we use. Right? So that's, what, that's the goal. That's the end game for us. We're trying to create players to develop skill sets so this happens and it becomes instinctive. Okay? So the best way for that to happen, once again, is we've got to target the struggle. So I'm going to give you an example of a real life example of how this takes place, okay? And it happened by accident. In the talent code, they talk about, they, they give this example about Brazilian soccer, right? And, Bra and Brazil has done an amazing thing as far as continuing to develop the most elite players in the world in unusually high percentage relative to the rest of the world. Well, how does it happen? What are they doing that the rest of the world isn't? Okay, and there's some that will suggest that it's a combination of nature and nurture, right? They've got a friendly climate for soccer. They have a passion for the game. It's almost like, you know, we'd like to think we have it in, in, in Canada. You know, hockey is, they eat, sleep, and drink it, right? Nationwide, it's almost a religion to them. For us, it's a religion in, in the United States. We live in the hockey hotbeds, I guess, or we love hockey, but that's what they're talking about as, par as far as their passion for hockey. And then they have this, right? They've got a diverse population. 40% of their population's poor, okay? And a lot of them see soccer as the means to get out of that plight. So there's some that would suggest that this is the formula, and this is why Brazil is developing better soccer players than the rest of the world. The problem with that argument is that those three things existed in the 1930s and 40s and they weren't developing soccer players. So what changed? In the 1950s, they, Brazil started to train in a particular a way. They stumbled on a tool, okay, that helped them, that helped in that development process. Okay? They found a way to increase their learning velocity and they were unaware of it at the time. They stumbled on this thing. Okay? And, the, and the tool was this game of futsal. How many people have heard of that? In Portuguese, it's called soccer in the room. Right? It, was, it was invented by a Uruguayan coach and it was a, training to, it was a, it was a rainy day training tool. So when they couldn't, they couldn't play soccer because the weather stunk and it was raining, they would bring it inside and they would play this game. So what is it? 
Number one, it's regarded as the incubator of the Brazilian soul. It's taken on a life of its own. Kids play it in the neighborhoods and at the soccer academies. Ages 7 to 12, they play on average three days a week. Top Brazilian players play thousands of hours of futsal. Okay? This guy here, Janino, he's a great Brazilian player. He never kicked a full-size soccer ball until he was 14 years old. He's one of the best players in the world. So here's the game. The ball's half the size, it weighs twice as much, and it hardly bounces. They train on basketball size, patches of concrete, wooden floors, dirt. It's a poor country. So they're finding any area in between their apartment buildings or whatever that they can find to play this game. Each side plays with five or six guys. The rhythm of the game resembles basketball or hockey because it's end-to-end -end action. Because they've, they've, what, have, what have they done? They've confined the space, right? So speed is an essential aspect of it. A lot of people that have studied this, this uh, Brazilian soccer believe that this is the impetus to their Brazilian skills. This is where they were born. Does this remind you of anything? Why is it effective? Number one, the math. Players touch the ball on average six, six times more per minute, according to a Liverpool University study. They have way more touches. The ball is small and heavy, and it demands and rewards more precise handling. You can't get out of a tight spot by booting the ball down the field. You've got to hang on to it. You've got to handle it. You're being forced to acquire those skills because of the nature of how the game's played. Sharp passing is paramount. The game is all about looking for angles and spaces, working quick combination with players. It's an understanding of time and space, right? And when you think about instinctive games, combative games like hockey, lacrosse, soccer, basketball, okay, when you, when you think about the nature of how the game is played, it's all about this. It's the understanding of time and space. It's jumping into windows of opportunity at the right time and then having the skill sets to be able to act on and execute uh, and take advantage of opportunities. That's what instinctive games are about, okay? Ball control is obviously critical and vision is critical. That's the game. It compresses soccer's essential skills into a small box. It places players inside the deep practice zone. It targets the struggle. They make and correct errors and they myelinate. That's how it happens. Problem solving is a big part of it, right? I would suggest to you that this is the one aspect in, in the way that I've observed our kids playing hockey and growing up is that we don't put them in enough circumstances where they're forced to have to problem solve. We give them the answers, right? That's what the system stuff is all about. Get it out, get it in, get it deep, right? Instead of creating circumstances where we challenge players to think for themselves. We condition them almost not to think by some of the circumstances. And, and this goes back to the discussion we had last night about at the youth hockey level, does winning and the priority on winning have an impact on development? Are there repercussions? I believe there are. This is one reason, right? Because it gets in the way of this process. I can coach players, I can play a north-south game, I can play a territory game, get it out, get it in, get it deep, don't turn it over, take advantage of the tag-up rule, take advantage of the no red line, stretch the ice, tip it in and forecheck. I can play that game and stay close, right? But having said that, what am I doing to my players? Am I making them better? Am I, am I training them or am I teaching them to think for themselves? and overcome the challenges that the game presents. Players in this game touch the ball 600% more often. Think about that. Think about that from the age of 7 to 15. If you, if you put players in a circumstance where they touch the puck 600% more times, do you think they would be better puck handlers? I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's really interesting when you think about it in these terms. So. That's, that's Brazilian soccer. That's that little game of futsal that took place because of the environment and the culture that, that's in Brazil. Does that remind you of anything? Does that game remind you of anything? Like, take it to our sport. Nothing? Small area games. Small area games. Street hockey. Informal settings, right? 
USA Hockey's whole small area game initiative, okay, is based on this premise. And it makes sense. I'll give you an example. There was a, there was a guy, and he was an elementary school teacher in Leeds, England. His name is Simon Clifford. He went over to Brazil. He's, he was also a soccer coach, loved soccer. Went over to Brazil for a year on his own dime to study what they were doing. And he thought he was going to see these soccer academies with these big green soccer fields and strength and conditioning programs and this, that, and the other thing. <clears throat> and what he saw was a poor country that had no money. And he saw kids playing in between apartment buildings on dirt floors or concrete. And he saw them playing this game with a ball that was half the size of a soccer ball. And, and it was like an aha moment for the guy. So he goes back to Leeds, England. He... he, he taught at a uh, Catholic elementary school. He took a group of 10-year-olds and he started, he started to apply this process. At age, and they laughed at him in England, all the soccer gurus. At age 14, okay, his team beat the, the Scottish national team and the Irish national team in the U14 level. Four years later. So there's something to this, right? For me, there's, there's really something to this. When I, when I was reading about this stuff, it was just jumping out at me that, that you know, when I think about what's going on and, and what USA Hockey's trying to do with their ADM model, as far as an age-appropriate approach, and that, that small game initiative, and there's a lot of resistance to that small game initiative, because people don't understand the nature of the game and the skill circuits that are required to be good. That's what small games do, okay? So let's talk a little bit about coaching methodologies now, all right? So we've talked about skill acquisition, biologically, how it occurs. Let's talk about strategies now. How, how, how can we leverage that knowledge, okay? Number one, we've got to understand the nature of our sport. And I'll go back to, once again, instinctive games. I'll draw the correlation. In the talent code, they talk about flexible skill circuits versus consistent skill circuits. Okay? Flexible skill circuits are required in instinctive games, like hockey, soccer, basketball, right? Where there's a high, the high level of unpredictability. There's opponents, there's teammates, and, and you know, it, that, that's, that's the, the nature of how the game is played. Consist, consistent skill circuit sports would be sports like gymnastics, golf, um, figure skating, right? Where it's really just about the individual. And it's about, you know, in golf, it's you and the ball. And so your success is based on a, on a foundation of technique, right? Uh, very different in nature of how those games are, are played, and also very different as far as <clears throat> how your body reacts to and acquires skills and the types of skill circuits that take place, okay? So flexible skill circuits are required in instinctive games, right? A game like futsal where things change rapidly. So your reaction, okay, to encounters and challenges in the game have to be quick. So in these types of games, the game itself serves as the factory, okay, of precisely the sort of encounters that coaches want to teach. The game becomes the teacher. It's experiential learning, okay? How many people have heard of the, game, the book, The Inner Game of Tennis? It's a terrific book, and it, it talks a lot a bit about how, how, we, how you learn. It's a great book, but one of the things they talk about in that book is, is, is they, they use the term childlike learning. It's, an un, it's unconscious learning. It's, it's like how a child learns how to walk. Nobody's got a dry erase board showing a child, hey, this is what you've got to do. You've got to stand up, get the weight on the balls of your feet, pull one foot in front of the other. No, that's not how it works, right? The child sits in the middle of the room. He watches his brothers and sisters. He watches his parents, and his brain fires. And, it fi and then he tries to get up and stumbles and falls, and, and the brain attends to the mistakes, and then it fires again, and then he might take a couple of steps, and then the, fi the neurons... They, they, they wire, and the myel myelination process takes place. That's childlike learning. It's experiential learning. It's the most powerful way we learn. So why wouldn't we take advantage of that, knowing that concept, right? That's what futsal does. Problem solving is a big part of it, right? We're, we're training p players to become independent thinkers. To stop the game in order to highlight some technical detail would be to interrupt the flow of attentive firing, failing, and learning, right? And for me, this is the heart of flexible circuit deep practice. 
So if we're going to put players in that activities where the game's going to be the teacher, we can't blow the whistle every two seconds and say, hey, you got to have your hand here or do this. we got to pick our spots, right? We pick our spots. Not to say that we don't offer coaching criticisms or critiques, but we can't stop the game constantly. We've got to let the learning process take place. Right? And they're going to make mistakes in that process. And, but that's, that's, you know, based on what we've, what we've gone through here, we've got an understanding of how, how the body biologically works and how skill acquisition takes place. Right? So I'm going to take you to this, this conference in 2004. Right? A guy by the name of Gessner Geyer was at Harvard University, and it was a bunch of neurologists that study the brain. And the people that attended this conference were people like uh, school teachers, K through 12, social workers, anybody that had interaction with kids. And essentially what they were trying to do was they were trying to bring these neurologists to uh, school teachers, educators, whatever, that deal and interact with children and, and try to tell them or help them with the research that they've done as far as how the, how the body or the brain optimally learns. Okay, the first thing they did, and I found this interesting, was they defined the word development. The eliciting of previously held and hidden potentialities and qualities. In other words, the, the skill level is in there. That's the hardware. That's the gene pool, right? They have talent. It's our job as coaches to facilitate that process. If we're not careful, we can get in the way. So that's the first aspect, and I know this term gets thrown around hockey rinks all the time. And in my personal opinion, is most people don't have the first inclination of what it means or how to do it. So how does it happen? It happens with interactions with the environment. This is the one takeaway I want you to I want you to think about. They talked a lot of, in this conference about implicit learning mechanisms. The majority of learning takes place implicitly, which is non-conscious. It's childlike learning. It's how a child learns how to walk. It's experiential learning. The, the, the neurons fire until they wire, and then they myelinate. And that's, how it, that's the most natural, the most powerful way we learn, and it's also the longest retention. So what's that, what's, what does that mean to us as coaches? So if we set up conditions in practice that create situations that we want to put players in, to help them improve in certain aspects of the game. And I'll give you some examples, right? So we set up the activity and then we step back and we let them play and participate and problem solve. The activity becomes the teacher. Here's a, here's a study uh, that was done at the, in the University of Calgary. I know Tom Rennie was a part of this study on decision training. And what decision training is, is it's an understanding of the intellectual aspect of sports, right? So decision training helps athletes handle pressure or competition by incorporating training methods, coaching methodologies, which is what we're talking about, that stimulate more accurately what happens in competition. It happens all the time in practice, and it happens at very young ages, if we're going to leverage this whole concept of decision training. Okay? So what are decision-making skills? Can we train these? Can we train these skills? Sure we can, by the types of activities that we put them in, the environment that we put the players in, right? So when you think of coaching methodologies, there are a couple of, there are a couple of different strategies that we apply as coaches. There's this bottom-up approach, which is a part to whole, right? We break a skill down, we simplify the process, and then we add building blocks along the way, right? And that's very much a part of what we do, and there's a place for that. We have to, we have to walk before we can run. Okay, so it's perfect progressions. There's isolation of skills, there's very low variability and, and complexity in the skills, and there's low levels of athletes' cognitive effort. There's really not much problem solving, it's more breaking down and isolating the skill, right? That's the bottom-up approach. And then there's the other the approach, which is the top-down, right? Which is more of a holistic approach where we're putting players in competition like drills that most simulate the game. Decision making is the emphasis. There's random practice. There's high variability and unpredictability as far as the activities that they're participating in. There's delayed feedback in the sense that coaches don't step in all the time, but there's instant feedback as far as that the game or the activity presents. Right? If I'm, if I'm in a small area game and I try a move three or four times and it doesn't work, 
then my brain's going to say, I better try something else, right? So that's kind of instant feedback when you think about it. And this high levels of cognitive effort because it's problem solving. This is how the game's played. Okay, and these studies that they did in the, at, the, at this study at the University of Calgary, they found that subjects trained under the bottom-up conditions had early levels of success, but failed later on. Okay, and then the the opposite effect was happened with the top-down approach. Okay, so the athletes that trained in these situations, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me give you an example. Of, of the one of the studies they did they did it they took a division one college baseball team right and they took they they broke them up into three groups of six and they had batting practice they took a control group and they did nothing they took a group of six players and they threw them a uh, hundred pitches and they told them we're gonna t we're gonna tell you what's coming we're gonna throw you 25 fastballs 25 curveballs 25 sliders 25 change-ups. So the, pitch, the, the batter knew what was coming. Then they took the third group and they threw 100, the same 100 pitches, but they didn't tell them what was coming, and it was random. For the first six weeks, the group that they threw the 100 pitches and they knew what was coming had better success. After the six-week period, the group, the third group, where they threw them random, uh, surpassed the other group. Okay, it's that cat and mouse game, right? That, that a hitter and a pitcher has as far as w trying to predict what's coming next and that type of thing. It's those anticipatory skills, those cues that hitters get when the ball's leaving the pitcher's hand that allows them to get their bat on the ball, right? So th that's, that's what's being trained in that top-down approach, right, as far as in, in, a, in, a baseball, uh, in a baseball scenario, okay? So that's what happens. So what is top-down coaching? The athlete trains within tactical situations where decisions are needed in hockey they are trained from the outset. The skills of the sport are taught within the context of the situations actually encountered in the game. So it's, you know, I use the term alignment, okay, where the, the, the sport-specific skills, puck handling, passing, receiving, are being trained within the context of how the game's played. We're not creating a false environment. Right? We may start that way and have them stick handle in and out of some pucks or whatever, but eventually we have to graduate and put these kids in circumstances where they have to stick handle the way they would have to win a game. We've got to put opponents in there. We've got to create some problem-solving activities so that they're, they're, they're acquiring and developing those skill sets at the same time that they're processing the game. We're not compartmentalizing the skill. Right? We're, we're, we're taking more of a holistic approach. It's flexible skill circuitry. So instead of teaching skills in isolated artificial drills, we place them in activities that provide the big picture. Delayed feedback is encouraged, and I spoke to that about as far as when the coach steps in as far as offering support, right? So, for me, those are the types of strategies that we're going to apply when we coach, right? So there's the top-down approach in isolating skills and slowing things down, and there is a place for that. But there's also the top-down approach where we're going to create activities that are very much like how the game is played, and we're going to train and develop the skill sets of the game within that context. And that way, the transfer of those skills from the practice environment to the game environment is most effective. If all you do is create a false environment in practice, and you never graduate and put players in a real environment, then the transfer of the skill to the game will break down. So at some point, we have to train in that environment. I'll give you a couple of examples, okay? Here's a drill. When I was coaching with the Rangers, and this was during the playoffs, so it was it was in between days, and it was a it was a um, it was an optional practice. So we didn't have everybody on the ice. So we we were working on different skill sets, right? So it starts with a give and go off the wall, and we're working on a release from the shot. You know, we're working on receiving, getting it in a shooting position, and a quick release, and then it's going to turn into a, a defenseman on the other side 
activating down the wall, which is something that we talked about as part of our team concept, getting our defensemen involved in the offensive zone. And this was one way on a high roll. And the defenseman would time his jump off the blue line, and they would create a two-on-one. <coughs> this is an example of a top-down drill, right? <coughs> Maybe the first part of it is, is a little bit of a false environment because we don't have an opponent. Okay, but we're still working on the passing, the receiving, the release, getting the shot off, trying to score. The two-on-one is problem solving. The two-on-one is a very real scenario that happens in a game when a defenseman jumps off the blue line. Now, if we had a whole team and we did this, we might add a circumstance where we play the two-on-one out down low. Maybe we play a second puck and we play a two-on-one out. Maybe we have his partner on the blue line and when the whistle blows, we have a coach in the neutral zone that spots a counter opportunity. And now, after the two-on-one takes place down low, we blow the whistle, the defenseman on the blue line goes back for the puck, and we work on a regroup. The defenseman defending down low has to gap up, and now it's a two-on-one off the rush. So it's, uh, you're getting a give and go off the half wall, which is a very real hockey play. We have a two on one off the half wall down low, which is a very real scenario. And then we have a, th a third two on one or second two on one off the rush that we could add in there. And then once that counter takes place, we'd have a group of players down the opposite end of the rink and they would start. So there's good flow, right? There'd be six players involved in that type of a circumstance. So this is what I mean. What, what's taking place in this type of a drill? Well, there's passing, there's receiving, there's working on a release, there's working on a shot, trying to score. There's problem solving involved because we're, we're working on two on ones. When the, if we play that puck out down low, uh, there's compete levels in, involved. Right? So there's a lot involved. It's a simple drill, but there's a lot involved. That's an example of a top-down drill, as opposed to just isolating a skill. Okay? We're training the, the certain skill sets within the context of some r very real scenarios, and what we did was we, we implemented a concept or a team concept, an offensive tactic that we were trying to, to, trying to, um, to institute with our team as far as getting our defensemen involved in the offense, in the offensive zone, right? So we're working on that high roll where, where a forward starts coming up the wall and that D jumps off the blue line and we create a scissors play off the, off the half wall at the top of the circles, right? So that, that's a team tactic. So we're building in concepts of our team even though we're working on different, different aspects of, uh, of the game itself and trying to make our players better, okay? So here's another one. Oops. This is going to be, uh, hold on. Okay, so here's the game. It's a two on two, and this player here is a support player behind the net. So if you drew an imaginary line from the, from the post to the dot on both sides of the rink, from the post to the dot, this player here is playing surface is all on the perimeter outside that line. In other words, he can play all around that area from dot behind the net to the dot, but he can't penetrate that imaginary line into the scoring area, okay? So the, the game is called two on two plus support. So if there's a change of possession, the team that steals the puck, they just have to hit the support player and then he's on their team and they play, right? So what, what are we trying to train here? What are we working on? What do you think the objective is? Any ideas? Let me help you. One of the things that we were trying to do was we're trying to, we're trying to learn how to generate offense from below the goal line, right? So we put a support player below the goal line. And so a lot of the offense that's going to take place through this activity is going to take place from plays in and around the net from behind the net, whatever, backdoor plays, little give and goes, right? So we're trying to generate offense from below the goal line. And this is an activity that we're using to try to train it. This is another example of a top-down drill. What the hell? So I'll, play a, I'll just play a little bit of it for you. How am I doing for time? I'm okay? I'm almost done. So this is an example of it, right? So it's just a two-on-two, two, change of possession, it's competitive, there's problem solving, 
there's give and goes, there's puck protection. Like think of all the skill sets that, that are required to play this kind of game. It's kind of like futsal. So these kind of activities, in my mind, are uh, invaluable as far as helping players get better and improve in certain aspects of their game, whether it be puck protection, puck handling, give and goes, one touches. Okay? And once again, this is during the playoffs, so it's not as intense. We have done these types of drills during the season, uh, during the middle of practice at both ends of the rink, and they're very intense when we do this. And what I would do is, is we would vary the numbers. Like in this instance, it's two on two plus one support. Sometimes we could do one on one plus one support, right? So we can change the numbers depending on how many people we have on the ice to work so that we have the proper work to rest ratio in order for that to happen. So this is another example of a top-down type drill, right? So in, in my mind, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to leverage, we're trying to leverage the, the, the learning process and how the body learns, right? We're trying to leverage that whole, that whole idea of experiential learning. Okay, last one. This is another game, and the way this one works is we have two support players. It's two on two, and then there's a support player that's on each dot that's stationary, can't move. They do move, they cheat, but they're not supposed to, right? And so it's a two on two, and the support players can play on the offense, whoever has the puck. So it's really a four on two. But if you watch the way the game evolves, what happens is it's really more like a three on two because it creates an, on, it creates a, a, an offensively dominant number in the playing area, whether it's on either side of the rink. And it becomes, you know, once again, it becomes a, a, a three on two for the offense. And they play. Okay? And once again, this is another kind of problem solving activity where players are putting in, in certain circumstances where they, and they can train their skill sets through this process. And by the way, the, the other aspect of it, as you watch it, is it's fun. Like the kid, the players love it. These kids, these guys are grown men and they're like kids in a candy store when we play this with them. They love it. We do these types of games a lot at the NHL level when uh, sometimes like Torts would call it specials where we'll break the ice up. We'll say we'll bring the defenseman down one end of the rink and then we'll bring, let's say, the center iceman in the middle and they'll work on face-offs. We'll have a coach dropping pucks and they'll work on face-offs. We're, work, we're working on, you know, uh, position-specific skills. You know, maybe defensemen down the other end are working on one-timers or whatever, uh, or pulling pucks off the kickboard on a wrap. And then we bring the wings down, down a third, down the third end, and we play games like this with them, right? And so we'd implement these types of drills when we have time and practice where we break the ice up and we do some position specific skill work. And we do that a lot. Like Torts and I, been in, in, since we've been coaching together, we, we do position specific skill work probably on average twice a week, formally as part of the practice. And then informally, when the practice ends and Torts goes off the ice, the assistant coaches, we take the guys and we do other work with them as well. One of the things we do at the NHL level, you know, we monitor the minutes played, right? So if there are certain guys that played less than 10 or 12 minutes, say, third or the, usually it's the fourth line guys and maybe your fifth and sixth defense pair, your defensemen. If guys didn't get a sufficient minutes in a game, the night before, at the end of practice, we would take them down one end and we would play these types of games with them because we're trying to get them reps because they didn't get it in practice. So at the NHL level, if you don't, you know, if, you're, if you don't pay attention to the guys that don't play as many minutes in the game, their skill sets will decline. By the time January rolls around, you know, they can't carry the puck from the blue line to the red line. So we monitor those minutes and we get them in these circumstances all the time so that they have an opportunity to practice real game scenarios. And what we do is we, we, we don't make it voluntary for those guys. They have to come down. And then anybody else that wants to participate is welcome to come down. And it usually it lasts about 10 minutes, 
10 or 12 minutes after practice, and you'd be amazed at how many volunteers come down and play. And they play because they love it. It's fun. It's hockey, right? It's hockey. They're playing hockey. And so these are the types of activities, in my mind, that optimize skill. And, and hopefully, based on what I, what I offered you as far as the, uh, the biology of, of skill acquisition and how it takes place, you'll understand why some of these strategies or these methodologies work. Okay? Um, so in summary, I know that was long. I, I appreciate you bearing with me. We talked about the responsibility to development, right? We identified qualities of an elite player. We talked a lot about that. We discussed the science of skill acquisition and learning. We identified coaching methods, right? That leveraged that science, right? We talked about isolation versus that top-down approach where you're training skills within the context of how the game is played, and we gave you some examples on how to do it, right? And, and don't misconstrue what I say. I'm not one to say to you that all you should do is, you know, you should never isolate a skill. I think there's a time and a place. I think there's a time and a place to slow that stuff down, okay? But having said that, I don't think it can be the majority or the, the highest percentage of your training environment. Your training environment should consist of a huge emphasis of a top-down approach where the skills of the sport are being trained within the context of how the game is played, right? And we talked about that transfer of skills so that there's alignment in your practice environment. It's very difficult to create a false environment and teach skills and then, and then think that you're gonna put them in the game and those skills are gonna transfer. They'll break down, right? They have, to be, they have to be trained under the demands of the real competition. So my challenge to you is, do your practices reflect an age-appropriate development environment? And think about that. And maybe, maybe there's something in this presentation that, that you can take away that will help you create a little bit of a better environment as far as where you guys go back and you coach your teams. And I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes. You know, sometimes I think as coaches we want to be relevant. And so we're always, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're always making sure that our players understand that, that we're the boss and and, we're, uh, and they should be checking in with the bench before stuff happens. But in essence, you know, once again, I'm going to quote Lou Vero, who's one of my favorite guys, has been around the game a long time. I was having dinner with him last night, and he talked a lot about Tarasov, the, the great Russian coach. And he said, he said to me last night, and it really hit home with me, that, you know, it's the job of the coach to serve the players. It's never the, it's never the job uh, of the players to serve the coach. So for me, this, this quote hits home. If you can make yourself progressively more unnecessary because your players become problem solvers and they, and they figure things out for themselves, so when you get to game time, all you should be able to have to do is open the gate and pump tires, then you're doing a good job. All right? That's all I have for you. Thanks for your time. Are there any questions for Mike? Sure. Absolutely. He just can't penetrate those imaginary lines. You know, like what I do a lot of times too is you, you couldn't see him on the uh, on the rink, but I get that big fat sharpie magic marker and I'll draw a dotted line so that they have visuals. You know, um, once you do it a few times, you don't need it anymore because they understand the game. You know, so. Um, but yeah, absolutely they can shoot. But yeah, here's what I think. I think you, you guys can take like those examples and create your own rules based on what it is you're trying to accomplish, you know? Um, you know, maybe they need to have a one touch involved before they can shoot, whatever, if you're working on, on one touches, you know? Like, you can be creative in how you set up those, um, those circumstances based on what it is that you're trying to develop and train. Any other questions? Great. Thanks, Mike. Sure. Appreciate it. Fantastic.